Wow, technical difficulties, right? Uh, but wow, what a, what a great way to introduce this video. I hope you kind of see what we're doing in Monte Castillo. Um, seriously though, seriously though, thank you everyone for attending. Isn't this party the bee's knees? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the, the bee's knees, right? Are you all having fun? I mean, we're trying to make it fun. Sometimes, you know, we run into some difficulties, but we work through it because we're better together, right? Right? All right, seriously though, without further ado, let me, let me just go ahead and get started. I mean, what are we waiting for? <laughs> oh, I've been working on that joke for a long time. All right, a quick show of hands though. Seriously, who drinks water daily in here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Actually, in fact, I'm going to take a drink right now. Mm. Tastes like orange and lemon. Mm. Who put orange and lemon in that water, by the way? That tastes amazing. Thank you so much. I see Alex, though. Wait, Alex, you didn't raise your hand. Do you not drink water? Do you only drink beer? I drink water, too. Oh, okay. But no, seriously, though, beer is about 95% water. Just a little fun, set, fun fact for you. I, I consume a decent amount of beer. I, I consider to be a water drinker 95% uh, of the time. Seriously though, another quick show of hands though, seriously. Who uses a toilet daily? Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, precisely what I thought actually. Everyone drinks water daily and uses the toilet daily, but how many of you, no need to show hands, really think about it? How many of you really think about your use. I mean, can you imagine a, what life would be like without this basic necessity, this basic resource of clean water to drink, or a toilet to flush, or having to just turn on your faucet and it's right there? Can you imagine life without that? In fact, there, there are many organizations that know what's going on with people that are experiencing those very basic resources that they don't have. They know that there are people that are lacking that. And there are many organizations doing this type of work out there. In fact, uh, the global water crisis is indeed a global water crisis, despite what Alex said earlier. I mean, it may be raining here, but it's not raining in Monte Castillo. They get less than 10 inches rain a year. So that's a serious problem when you're trying to get clean water and you're trying to have a community that is sustainable, when you can't even get water and the water you do get is contaminated. Uh, as of 2004, however, there's many organizations doing this type of work. I mean, there's 15, 20, 30 organizations doing work in the global water crisis. But as of 2004, in an assessment of 20 developing countries and regions by the Rural Water Supply Network and USAID, it was discovered that approximately 40% of clean water solutions in communities in need in developing countries fail or are failed already. That's atrocious that that's happening, right? But sadly, this is all too much of reality for millions of our brothers and sisters around the world. And this is precisely why the Lord has inspired me, as you've already heard, to start Veracqua Veravita, including my trip to Haiti. And, you know, our inspiration, right, is it's based in, in our call. It's our call to serve. It's our call to, to help make a difference to those in need in developing countries that we're called to serve the less fortunate. And we're, we're rooted in Scripture. We're inspired by Scripture. John 4.10 says, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked Him. And He would have given you living water. We aim to give living water to the people we serve. I mean, this gospel is at the core of what we do at Veracqua Veravita. All right. Alex, I'm going to call on your assistance real quick. So, we're going to play a little game. I'm going to rattle off a, a slew of facts about the global water crisis. And Alex, you're going to time me. Just in your head. Because I know you're a math guy. You can count really well, right? Um, don't, let get, don't let me down. Uh, so here goes. Approximately 844 million people worldwide lack access to safe, clean water resources. 
30% of, 7% of those live in sub-Saharan Africa. This is particularly real for me because I've been to two countries, actually four countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Approximately two and a half billion people live without adequate sanitation. 1.7 billion people live in areas where groundwater is being extracted faster than it is being replenished. That means that in 20 years, there's gonna be a serious problem in those communities. Four out of five people worldwide face risk to their water security. Achieving universal access to save water and sanitation would save two and a half million lives every year. 443 million school days in total are lost each year due to water-related diseases. How long was that, Alex? 55 seconds. 55 seconds. Well, I want to tell you something. Today, in the 21st century, 2018, one child is dying every 120 seconds from a waterborne illness. Every 120 seconds. So in the, tw in the amount, twice the amount of time it took me to slow up those facts, one child would have died. That is unacceptable. We have resources here, and we're not, we're not able to bring clean water to communities in need in developing countries. What's going on? We have to do something that's different. And let me put this into context, right? Facts are great. People are like, oh, facts, like so many. Like we go on Google and it's just like facts all the time. Like more information is, in, is like developed or comes available to the human person on the internet every day than like the previous like 100 years combined. Can you believe that? That's insane. Like we hear facts all the time, but you know what really resonates actually? It's stories. So I'm gonna tell you a story about a guy from Monte Castillo, Peru, where we're working right now. Manuel is his name. He is a man that I met a couple years ago when we first started working in Peru. And on my most recent trip to Monte Castillo this past August, where I was there for five weeks, as you could see some of the video showed the content of what we were doing down there, building a clean water treatment facility, right? Well, on my most recent trip, to, we, we, we ran into Manuel. And Manuel is a man that has unfortunately been afflicted by unclean water. His experience is all too common in Monte Castillo and frankly around the world. I remember meeting him, like I said, in 2016. He used to be the manager of the utility agency I use that word rough, loosely, right? That used to manage the, the loose infrastructure that they had in Monte Castillo. He was a vibrant, strong, healthy man, full of life and energy. However, in his present condition, just four weeks ago, five weeks ago when I was in Peru, you can guess it, his present condition is not good. He's been, he's been infected, in fact, Sometime between 2016 and now, he consumes con contaminated water that contained larval eggs. So, bear with me here. He was subsequently medically diagnosed. Now, if you're squeamish at all, hopefully you're not still eating your dinner. Uh, that's why we wanted to put this story after dinner, you know what I mean? Uh, some of those light, light uh, weak stomach people, you might want to close your ears here. But I want to tell you that this reality is, is, is in fact what goes on all the time in developing countries. So these larval eggs got into his stomach. The negative impacts of that water resulted in him getting those larval eggs into his bloodstream. They got to his brain and they hatched into parasitic worms. And over a period of time, he began to slowly and painfully, painfully become paralyzed. He subsequently lost a, a dangerously unhealthy amount of weight, motor skills, speaking skills, and his life has been forever changed because of unclean water. Because of something as basic as clean water and wastewater, he just, he went that way. It's really sad. Um, sorry, I'm getting emotional here. Um, but by the grace of God, right, in modern medicine, they, they were able to save his life. So he's still alive. So let's, let's praise that. And that's, that's beautiful that he's still alive. But it, 
it's sad that he got sick in the first place. You know, and it's, it's often that he and his people in Monte Castillo um, have to run into these issues every day. Uh, they don't know what kind of water they're going to get or if it's going to be contaminated that day or not, or if it's going to get them sick that day or not. They just have to sometimes hope and pray and do the best they can. My timer. Um, right now, in Monte Castillo, we're building a water treatment facility that's going to be able to provide clean water to those 7,000 residents of Monte Castillo. That's going to change the lives of people like Manuel. If it affects someone, a grown man like Manuel, like it did, imagine how it affects the children and the elderly, right? I know there's a, a lot of people in this room that have kids. I also know there's a number of, of elderly folks in here. And you guys are oftentimes, you know, generationally speaking, the ones that are getting looked over. And that's what's happening in developing countries too. Um, what's going on right now is that UN Development Board says that water is the origin of life. And without it, there is no life at all. And in its scarcity, in its scarcity, not even just like you, you have some, like you have a little bit, like it's just scarce, right? In its scarcity, low quality development will continue to persist. That means developing countries will continue to be stuck in their rut because they don't have water and wastewater. Basic rights to life. So what is our mission? Our mission is to bring physical and spiritual that's double echoing. Our mission is to tap into the physical and spiritual nature of water to empower people and communities in need in developing countries that we're able to bring about a generation of clean water and sanitation solutions. We're founded on three guiding programs, water, sanitation, and hygiene, community development. This is where we do our focused strategic partnerships with locals. This is where we begin to empower the local people with assessment surveys, getting their feedback, getting their input. Because frankly, right now, like I mentioned, 100, oh sorry, like I mentioned, 20 plus organizations that are doing work in this sphere, just water, right? In the global water crisis. And yet there's still 40% of communities that are getting a solution and then it's failing. That's not, that shouldn't happen. Like that's a horrible statistic. Something is being done incorrectly. So we have to be different in what matters. And the key thing for us at Veracqua Veravita, we're different in what matters because we empower people. It's all about empowerment. It's all about education. It's all about letting them be a part of the solution. So we also, that leads us really quickly into our second program, of course, which is our education program. Our education program is focused on doing that means of empowerment in a general sense from a wash, water, sanitation, hygiene perspective, in a specific sense from training, specific hands-on training, like in Monte Castillo right now, we're building a water treatment facility, right? Well, how, how is that solution going to be sustainable 50 years from now, generation upon generation? We have to train the people to manage it, to operate it, right? We have to invest in the people, not throw money at something. We have to throw time at something. And that's where our second program is so critical to what we're doing. It's education. It's empowerment. It's believing in the dignity of the person. And what's cool, that leads us real, real smoothly into our third program. It's like I planned this or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> our third program is missionary. So what, if, if we're going to invest time, right, we need people, right? You can't invest time without people, right? So we need to be missionaries. And we can do that. It's beautiful. We can do that. And this is a unique concept that the Lord kind of smacked over my head and he said, hey, Jacob, you should do this. We can do that both domestically and globally. Right? You hear about missionaries. Oh, I'm going to go abroad. I'm going to do this work. I'm going to build a house. Great. That's awesome. But what about those people that can't afford that? That they don't have the time to take a trip like that to Africa. They want to still feel, and they have a, they have a, a right, honestly, to feel like a missionary in some sense. And we do that because, we, and we can do that, it's beautifully because we can connect the people that we're serving with the people that, we're, that are serving globe or domestically. People that volunteer with us. 
The people that volunteer us, tear with us will know this. Um, Sharon is not in here, but Sharon is our marketing advisor for Veracqua Veravita. And she has already begun to feel a sense of missionary work to the people we're serving because there's such an inundation of, of storytelling and connection, and we're building these, these ongoing relationships. For instance, I mentioned her in the video. Her name is Alcira. She is our local advocate in Monte Castillo. She like messages me every day. And that's never been easier because, I mean, frankly, more people have cell phones in developing countries than have clean water, which is a sad statistic. But there's something that we can utilize that tool for. We can build those bonds of friendship. We can build that solidarity bridge, right? We need to do that because it's not going to succeed otherwise. So I want to do something really fun, actually, to lighten the mood because that was a, that was a serious topic. We're going to take a selfie. This is going to be fun. I've always wanted to do this. All right, everybody, lean in. All right. <laughs> you know, um, we strongly believe that at, at Veracqua Veravita, we are better together. And so, you know, I, I know that you all didn't come here necessarily to hear me talk, but hopefully you're darn glad sure you did because <laughs> I'm a pretty good speaker sometimes. However, however, I would be remiss to not mention a few things first. First of all, I stand here overwhelmed by everybody's presence and your support. I think we sold all of our bottles of whiskey. We've sold almost half or more of our bottles of wine. It's cool because we can come together and I ne believe me, we're what, 130-ish people here tonight? There's a quote by Margaret Mead, it goes, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Because indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Right? Like, and we're not a small group. <laughs> we're 130 people. This is awesome. And, and honestly, my greatest hope is that, in the words of St. Catherine of Siena, that y'all, man, I'm from Indiana, but I'm super Texan, aren't I? Uh, y'all, y'all would come to the realization of the fruition of the reality that if everyone was doing that, what God created them to do, we would set the world ablaze. I want to see the world on fire with water. Isn't that weird? <laughs> finally, finally, finally. In closing, high and fine literature is wine. Mine is only water, but everybody likes water. Thanks, Mark Twain. <laughs> now, hold on, shh, shh, be sure. Don't let the coppers find out about this speakeasy. Because this speakeasy is going to happen every stinking year. Thank you very much. <laughs>